I tried to get a blowjob from my babysitter. I was a kid. She was a Puerto Rican chick named Tita. And I kept asking her about blowjobs. She goes, I'll give you a blowjob. So I gave her a bag filled with quarters that I had. And she came into the room, and I took a shower. I combed my hair. I put cologne on. And she came into the room and blew on my stomach and said, that's a blowjob, and took my $20. And I just fucking killed the dog. I cried myself to sleep. That morning, my mom, I woke her up. I go, I got to talk to you. <laughs> my mom's like, what is it? In broken English, and my teeth stole my $20. She said she's going to suck my dick, and she didn't. My mom's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about? You're like six or seven. What are you talking about? I said, I, I wanted a blowjob. I gave her $20, and then she took my $20. I'm going to fucking kill her, Ma. And my mom's like, are you fucking crazy? Why would she suck your dick for $20? She can get 50 at a bar. <laughs> Why would she suck your little helmet dick for $20 and shit? You were how old? Six. Six, seven. How old was she? 32. <sighs> how, when, when did Muhammad Ali fight Joe Frazier the first time? 71, maybe, right? 71. I was probably eight. I was a little kid, man. My she mom had stole your money. Oh, my mom had to give me back the 20. I made my mom give it back to me. Your mom I, gave it to yeah, you? Yeah, my mom said, what would it take to make this problem disappear? So she gave you 20 just to shut you up? Yeah, because she knew I would hit, hit teeth in her sleep. I would kill her in her sleep. She was sleeping on the couch. The babysitter fell asleep on the couch. I'm oh, like, my Listen, God. Either you give me the $20 or I'm going to fucking kill her right there in her sleep. <laughs> <laughs> my mom's like, are you fucking crazy? I'll give you the 20. Just leave teeth alone. I didn't talk to Tita for a year, dog. Should never talk to her again. When was it? Seventy-one. Yeah, seventy-one. I was, I was eight. And she's ripping off little kids. She was great though, Tita. I had great, great babysitters growing up. <laughs> I didn't like my mom going out at night. My mom had the bar, so I would spend the whole day with my mom. And then at night, she'd have to go to the fucking bar, and it would drive me crazy, Joe. I want to go to the bar. Right. You can't go to the bar. You go to school. I don't give a fuck. Let me come protect you. So Bars are weird. I would fucking wait for her to get to Jersey, and then I'd cause a war in the house. And she'd have to get back in the car and come over to 88th Street, fuck me up, put me to sleep, get in bed with me and lay down, and then she would go back to the bar and fucking close it. I'd wow. put it through hell, man. Hell. And then when we moved in Jersey, I would call her up. I was scared at night because I thought the house was haunted. <laughs> So I would call her up and then, you're going to get down here. I'd be crying and shit. Finally, she goes, just take a cab to your friend's house, sleep over there. There was a year I didn't sleep at my house, you know. Really? Like a year. When I was in the seventh grade, I didn't sleep at my house. Never. I would go there after school, get clothes, and go to my friend's house and sleep there and live there. I was scared of fucking ghosts and shit. <laughs> my grandparents insisted their house was haunted. They had a guy uh, during the uh, 50s who rented a room upstairs. So a local guy was a bachelor, and he just rented a room because, um, you know, people did that back then. They were poor. And uh, that guy died. I think he died while he was at the house. I don't remember. But they insisted that the fucking guy was still, like, walking around. They'd hear him walk around. I lived there for months when Never I first moved. Nothing. Never heard shit. Then I realized, you know what a lot of that is? <sighs> people just get bored. They want there to be a ghost. They want something crazy to be going on. They're bored. They don't have any excitement. And so the only excitement is like being in that room in the dark and having feelings about something that's not even real. You're, you're like, oh, I, I feel something. I feel a presence. I feel a presence. <laughs> There's a presence. There's something in this room. There's something in this room. We gotta get the fuck out of this room. Meanwhile, nothing happened. It's just you're in the dark. You're in the dark in an old house. But you're bored as fuck. That's what it is. I don't know, Joe. I don't know, dog. I lived in a haunted fucking house. <laughs> when? In 19... My mother bought this house in North Bergen, New Jersey, on Givenad Terrace. Givenad Terrace was originally the Givenad... Um, what's when kids die? When parents die? Orphanage. When kids go, it was an orphanage. The orphanage set fire in the 40s. So they took Charles Court and Givenad Terrace and built it over this orphanage. There was an article about it on Facebook about six months ago about the whole giving that terrorist fucking spooky shit. Yeah. So in that house my mother bought, the reason why my mom, my mom got in that with the alias was because we came in with heavy cash and the guy killed himself in the garage. <laughs> All right, the guy hung himself in the fucking Ooh. garage in the 60s, so his kids were selling the fucking house. Wow. We didn't know about this. I never knew about this till years later. Once we moved in, remember in the beginning I was going to Catholic school, so I only slept there on the weekends. 
Once I moved in full time, like in the sixth and seventh grade, was when I would hear the ghosts at night. What would you hear? I would hear them coming up the fucking stairs and shit, and I would cry and yell. Right. So they sent me to the Santa Ria lady's house, and she told me to put a glass of water under my bed with a red towel on the top. And I would sleep better, but I would still hear fucking noises at night. I was fucking, and that's all that spooky shit. Now, do you remember when we did Tom Likas years ago and my friend called? Mm -hmm. The girl, Joey, how are you, Coco? Okay. Right. Her brother died on that block. When he was 16, 15, he died on that block. They're Sicilians. And if you think Cuban people are creepy with their Santeria and shit, nobody's creepier than old school Sicilians. I mean, she broke it down. She kept telling me, I told my husband, Sicilians don't live on dead end streets <laughs> because they're bad luck. Like, they broke, like, when I see them now, they still fly out here, the, the specials. And come Dead end streets are bad luck? Oh, yeah, the Sicilians. I mean, she's an old school Sicilian that she took the fish, the eyes from fishes to help people see better, to <laughs> help people. You ever see the movie Sleepers? You ever see the movie Sleepers? Which movie Movie is that? Sleepers about that the one four with kids. The heads explode? No. The no, that's fucking, scanners. The fucking heads explode. This is about Sleepers. the four kids who rob a hot dog man and by mistake a guy dies and they send him to a jail. Who's in it? Uh, uh, look, all-star cast. Uh, Brad Pitt. The oh, Nero was the priest. I do believe the I saw that. The book is a lot better. The movie yeah. sucked because they put too many stars in the movie. Too many But it's about stars. four fucking kids that get sent to an orphanage and they get beat up or whatever the fuck it is. But before that, they go to work for a mob boss. If you've ever watched any mafia movie, Every mafia movie blows the characters. The only mobster that was ever any good in any Italian movie besides Marlon Brando was the guy that played the mobster in this movie. Put, see if you can find Sleepers King Benny. King Benny was a bad motherfucker. He was an Italian actor that they recruited to come over. He got didn't even speak that good of English. Wait till you see the King Benny. But well, King Benny's explained to him that he takes the eyeballs to this lady for headaches. When I was a kid, look at King Benny. King Benny is a bad motherfucker. There's a <laughs> dog. There's a part where King Benny has to go deal with fucking brothers in Harlem. And the guy says to him, man. But you said this movie sucks. The movie's a five. But him, as a, you know who's in this movie? Your chubby buddy. The guy you did softball with. That movie. Mike Starr? No. The Spanish really? kid. That you did that series with. He was a Spanish kid. Louis Puerto Lombardi? No, no, he's Italian. Puerto Rican Port kid. Oh, Puerto Rican kid. Oh, I know who you're talking about. He plays. The kid that well, he, he went plays, on. He was in Lost. See if scene from that. See if he was have, in Lost. No. No? No. The kid, the Spanish kid, he plays Fat Mancho. Mm. See if they have the scene from Sleepers with the black guy. When the black guy says to him. See if they have the scene from oh, a movie that sucks? No, 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 no. He says to him, dog, look at you. You bring style to the game. The Italian guy goes, I cannot help you. My tailor is dead. I mean, this guy's got lines in this fucking movie. And they never talked. He died years later. Like, they were saying, who the fuck is this guy? The guy is just a monster. Just, the, my point is, it's not about <laughs> fucking sleepers or the fucking guy. What's the point? I have no idea. I'm too Jesus stoned. Jesus <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I wonder how he's gonna. No, wrap no, no. This we're up. talking about we're talking about <laughs> four kids. We're talking about four kids and shit. Like what, what? Sicilians. Oh, the Sicilians. Well, we're huh? talking about bad luck blocks. They have, they dead have, ends. They just have uh, a spooky belief. So they came to me years later, and were telling me all about this block. How how many people had 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 bad luck on that block after that? Like the the Maloney's died from cancer. The both of them. You know, the parents, the, the O'Rourke's died from cancer. The girl across the street died in a car accident. Raul, I just robbed him. Raul and his family, I just took a stereo, and I wouldn't let him in my fucking bedroom for years. <laughs> How do you rob somebody's house? And I hung out with the kid, because years later we became friends. While they were moving in, I robbed Raul and his family. And I took the stereo, some kid took the fucking desk. It was amazing. And now Do you we talk to him anymore? Raul, no, no. Raul ended up fucking moving to the Bronx in the eighth grade overnight. They left, they owed money on the rent. So, But he would come to my house and go, can't we go to your room and listen to the stereo? That's not a good idea. <laughs> <coughs> Hilarious. Terrible. No. Do, you, do you ever look back on your past and go, how the fuck did I become like an upstanding citizen? How did I become a Every regular day. person? Last night I was telling these stories that I was shaking. Well, I remember when I first met you, you were always a great guy. 
but you were you were way more dangerous. Like you were you were oh. a dangerous person. Like you could do you could do some ridiculous shit. You uh you were very volatile. There's a part of me that's a very, very nice law abiding person. There really is. There's a part of me that's always wanted to try to be a nice person. But there's a part of me that does not comprehend human a part of human behavior. Because it would not be allowed how I was raised by no means at all. What do you mean? Just stupid human behavior that I see every day now. It would not oh, I see. be acceptable right. in how I was raised or how the people I grew up with were. So when I look at that on behavior, my head explodes. I really can't handle it. And I didn't. I got a beating when I was 19. That was such a great beating. It was worse than the one that Bernard Hopkins put on Felix Trinidad. <laughs> and that's the day I made my decision. My hand-to-hand combat days are over. Like, I, I don't need this shit in my world. If you come into my world and you're disrespectful, I'm going to hit you with a weapon. I'm going to hit you with a chair or a bottle. I threw a lot of bottles at the store, <laughs> though, a couple of glasses. You definitely threw some shit at the store. I don't fuck around with people because I don't like people fucking with me. I'm really sensitive. I don't know how to handle it. But see, I think it's it's one of the things we were talking about when we were talking about um, um, p- people who go to war and how they get addicted to that feeling. And then it's almost like... Um, like that becomes their world, right? Well, I almost feel like with with some people they become they become like real addicted to like bad situations. I was, you know, you get addicted to drama in drama, your life. Right? You 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 don't know how to handle life if there's no drama in your life. There was times I would rob Joe Rogan, knowing that Joe Rogan knew I was going to rob him, and my state of mind was, now what? <laughs> now what? Now what? So how are you going to get this back? You'd cause an because issue. Because I didn't know how purpose. to live without the right. swirl of yeah. danger. Yeah. You know, and let's be honest. The last 10 years I did blow were not because of an addiction. The last 10 years I did blow because I was addicted to that state of mind. Where always, you were always in need of something. Mm-hmm. The thrill was going to get the coke and driving yeah. home with the coke in the car. Yeah, that's something that you, when you told me that, I, it was the first time anybody had ever articulated it that way. Like, what you were addicted to was not even necessarily the drug. It's the whole thing, the driving, the, whole, the, danger, the danger, the police, the going to the guy's place to buy it, the cop. Everything. I would look at myself after snorting at 2, 3 in the morning and see this person that I didn't even recognize in the mirror. I wouldn't even want to look at him because I was so ashamed that I let that position take over my mind. It wasn't the fact of the coke or the whatever or the getting my dick sucked or the doing dirty things. It was the fact of getting it and driving and fronting it mm. and, and all the scamming that went with it. And, and somebody told me when I got locked up, they said, you think of all the time you put into scams. Think of it, you put that time into doing something on a positive level. It, there's no surprise that my life has changed as much as I did without the drugs because 60% of your mental state was always in those drugs. Yeah. No matter. The other 40 was in comedy. The other 37 was in comedy, and the other three was in God knows what the fuck it was. But 60% of your day is dominated by that addiction. Or whatever drives you and with some people they've described it as like the addiction and having that addiction was like almost like a built-in excuse to not live up to their full potential in anything they're trying to do absolutely you all, for, well for starters it's not it's it's the personal blame you want that just in case if you fail you always have a fucking excuse. Right. Well, what did you expect? I was having those problems those years. You didn't have a problem. Having a problem is when, uh, you know, you get fucking shingles or, or your family member has cancer. That's a problem that happens in life. The coke and all that shit is your own man, man-made dilemma. Are you with mm-hmm. me? Like, these are the things you create, all these things you create. You know, I think about that last year I did blow. I was ready to call 60 Minutes. Like, I think of this state of mind right now. Like, I had already a pitch for 60 minutes to explain to them that I had found the cure for cocaine. That if you do heroin on Mondays, just a little bit, you will not snort the rest of the week. (laughs) Like, I was really going to pitch 60 minutes. I was going to get an agent and go to CBS and go, listen, I got a groundbreaking idea. There's no reason for rehabs. We'll get that white powder you motherfuckers are going to war for. And we'll get that little white poppy seed, we'll make it into some pill, and we'll get people high on Monday, because the rest of the week I didn't want to get high. 
How crazy is that? <laughs> and I was doing heroin on a Monday, and it wouldn't let me do coke the rest of the week. I look forward to Mondays. Fuck CSI Miami. Why would you? Why only Monday? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I have no fucking idea. That was just a. You gotta start the week off right. Yeah, that was. Just and this a, is snorting it. Yeah, snorting it. Two little lines of heroin just to get me out. And what does it do? Like, what's the feeling? Hit. hit tell me what it feels like when it hits you. Oh, it takes a couple of minutes to hit you, and you feel this weird thing, and then you feel like your blood pressure going up, and you feel like this euphoric uh, warmth. You feel like this fucking warmth. I, I felt like my body. To, you ever take a wet shit? <laughs> it's warm, and you can see if you shit outside, steam's gonna come out of it. Right. That's what your body feels like. That warmth, and then I would get an urge to puke. For a couple minutes, I would gag and puke. A little bit would come out of yellow. And then after I puked a little bit, I would just go into this state of fucking momoness for four hours. It was like smoking indicas all day. And momoness. Like just sitting there smoking cigarettes, looking out a window. And I'd make believe I was writing John Lennon type lyrics to <laughs> jokes <laughs> until I looked at them the next day. This brilliance about a refrigerator. Like I remember writing a bit about a refrigerator once. And looking at it the next day and say, thank God. Thank God I never tried. You know what I'm saying? Like little things like just. Well, that was Hedberg's drug of choice. And his jokes. Man, I mean, it's. I think he's probably the best non sequitur joke guy ever. Because all his jokes are unrelated. It's like, here's a non sequitur. Here's some other things I was thinking about. Here's something I thought. Here's something I saw. And it was like, I was listening to it the other day. It's like. Half of his jokes were only funny because he was saying them, you know, but they were hilarious. hilarious. Like he had a, he had a way of doing it that was kind of like heroin comedy, you know? Would like, you be messed up during the week or no? Who? Oh, who you. So, uh, it'd take me a day to recover on Tuesdays. I'd be out. I didn't say nothing to nobody. I was doing the heroin and I wasn't doing coke. So I was really fucking And so happy. you would be like sober Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Yeah, and yeah. then you'd look forward to the big bump on Monday. Yeah, that kid's dead. He used to send it to me. He used to send me $7 bags. What kid? His name was uh, Bonehead. He died from an OD. How weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Figured I, that guy was going to live forever. I, I knew, Bonehead? I knew Bonehead from Fuck. the time. I rest in peace. You, know what <laughs> you lost Bonehead, bro. Let me tell you something about Bonehead. Bonehead was like your boy. He was... I could go into a room with 90 motherfuckers and Bonehead will liquidate 10 of them. Bonehead was a bad motherfucker, dog. I love Bonehead. Bonehead had three brothers. I loved all of them. But Bonehead was... And, and Two of the brothers were very successful. And believe it or not, Bonehead was successful. As a plumber, he had own, his own company. He only went out crazy at night, Bonehead. Bonehead, when I was 17, would take me to McSorley's Ale House in New York City. No ID. He called the bartender over and give him three mugs of beer, give him three mugs of beer, and give him a bowl of chili. And Mughead would take ten bucks from the both of us, and he'd go to Washington Square Park, and he'd come back and he'd give me eight volumes. And by the meantime, he would go buy his heroin, and he'd buy these mixture of pills, and he'd melt them too, the black and whites. Then he'd take us to a strip club in New Jersey or something, and then he'd take us home. And the next day, seven in the morning, there's strip head, there's, there's bonehead in the fucking in the fucking uh, plumbing van up in Dandy. He was a functioning addict. He wasn't like your regular. There's a lot of those guys out there. And he had a chick that was a 13. Really? She was half Asian and half Irish. Good Lord. And they used to do heroin together, and they'd pass out in the living room, and he'd fuck, and they'd both go to sleep. And then I'd be in the bedroom, because I just moved in with Bonehead's family. <laughs> Okay, they were Italian, bro. They were real fucking Italians. And I, the mother used to, the mother was the first person who ever made me an egg cream. She was a little Irish chick, and she said she used to say the word Earl. She couldn't say oil, and she was the bookkeeper for Union Fifty Two, whatever the Teamsters, the Laborers Union. And, you know, I was over there one day when I was sixteen. She goes, "You got a book? Nah, walk me to work tomorrow. I'll get you a book. You can start fucking being a hottie." So I, you know, like a, a hot carrier? Like hot the, carrier? Yeah, they're for, for brick masons. Oh, okay. So she goes, I can get you with the Italians over by the brick masons because she was from Hoboken. So she got me a book. I financed it. She got a loan shark to finance it. I love these people. 
This is I'm, if I'm thinking my, my I don't like doing documentaries, but I need to do a, a documentary about this family because it's the rise and fall of an American family that I saw before my eyes. As a child, I went over there and ate with them. You know, I hung out with all three brothers, by the way. Like I wasn't just friends with Bonehead. I hung out with Chrissy Fish, and I hung out with the little uh, whatever his name was. But Bonehead was my nighttime guy. Bonehead used to take me into the murky waters of the underworld. He could, me, <laughs> he could get me guns and shit. Now the medium brother was a drug dealer in the '80s, and he drug he sold big times coke, and he used to buy jewelry, and he used to put them in a tackle box. So one night, me and the younger brother in the bed sleep, and Bonehead comes in to borrow money from us. Because he was going to the city to get heroin. And he goes, he, and I go, Bonehead, I got to go to the bank. I don't have any money on me. He went into his brother's room. And instead of, his brother was sleeping, the drug dealer. Instead of just opening up the tackle box and taking $40 out, he took the whole tackle box. And it had 40000 in cash and another thirty in jewelry. He went to the Bronx. These are the best times of my life. <laughs> you want to talk about comrades? This is the best time of my life. <laughs> Bonehead. This is your war stories? And you uh, thought the house was haunted and that no, was scary. No, no, this was not a haunted house at all. These people were decent Italian people. The dad was a longshoreman and the mom was in charge of the Teamsters Union. And they hung out with Westies. They hung out with the fucking... The mother was friends with this dude that was a, a, a whatever for the Westies. And he used to get me jobs. He would get me jobs casing joints. You know when you have a summer job? Nah, he would tell me, come here. I want you to go in that warehouse. I'm going to give you 200 and they're going to give you 180. I want you to go in that warehouse and write down all the alarms and tell me where the safe is, who walks around the safe, and he would pay me money. This is a great house, dog. Old school Italian house, but back to Bonehead. Bonehead has the fishing tackle box. He's about to go upstairs to buy heroin and shoot it. He puts the tackle box in the garbage can in front of the building and puts a lid on it. When he's upstairs shooting heroin, the garbage men come. And they take the 40 large with the 30,000 in fucking jewelry. <sighs> Do you understand me? I mean, this was nonstop. Another night, Bonehead came home high on heroin, and he decided to make French fries. <laughs> so he put the pot out. Remember the, the, the remember in the eighties they had those pots you could bring it home with the hot oil, and they would boil, and you could throw French fries. America went crazy over them. I forgot what they were. Crazy. Everybody was French making, fry machines. Everybody was making <laughs> onion rings and shit. Well, he did heroin and knotted up. Left and that the thing fu- running. And the thing went on fire. We're, of course all, it did. we're all in the fucking house. Oh, Jesus. All right. I wake That's up, oil. I wake up to ba boom and alarms and all some Kurt's waking me up and we go out of the house and the father's outside and the grandmother and the fire department crawls on top of the roof, Joe, and they're hitting the fucking <laughs> roof to let the smoke out and fire trucks are coming from the side laying water and they got the sirens in the middle of all this. It's eight in the morning and we all look around and go, oh my God. Emil's still in the house. Bonehead was still in the house on fire. Bro, they turn the fire off, they go in. He's still with his feet up. <laughs> with his hands crossed. Just heroin out of his I'm mind. Watching TV like that. <laughs> he slept through the fire? Oh my God, everything. When they woke him up, he goes, are my fries ready? <laughs> This is how crazy this family was. Oh, are my fries oh, ready? Oh, my They're fries like, Bonehead, ready. we have two fucking battalions out there. <laughs> <laughs> we got half a 9-11 out there. Oh, my God. And you're still fucking sleeping. Oh, my God. They burned the house down. Burned the fucking kitchen down and half the bedroom. They had to move into a hotel for six months. And they had a grandmother downstairs who was old school Italian, but she couldn't smell. So every time we smoked pot, we'd just go down there and blow smoke in her face. And grandma would pass out in the wheelchair, and that was the end of it. I mean, it didn't stop. It didn't stop. Jeez. So this is why you get mad at people for binge-watching stuff on Netflix, and this is what you were talking about. I get mad at everything, Lee. What do you <laughs> got to bother me for? I get mad when people are like, he used to hide the coke. The medium brother used to hide the coke under his car. And I'd be walking down the hill, and I could see a little container under He didn't even have a Maserati. What's the other Italian car? Fiat. This is how much of a guineas these motherfuckers were. What's the other Italian car? Well, it's a Fiat, like you said. The Avanti. Avanti? Oh, okay, I remember those. Remember that piece yeah, of shit? That was a piece of shit. Those are pieces of shit. Can you show me a piece of car of Avanti? I don't trust anything Italian. Oh, my God. That was a, he tried to sell it to me once. It was like, he, it's worth 20. I'll give it to you for two grand. Yeah, then I drive it down the corner, it blows up. Like, I feel like even Look. if you buy a Ferrari, I feel like if you drive that thing, it's going to fall apart. I'm like, I like, I trust German cars. You know, I don't trust people like me making cars. 
What's the other one? The the other one that Lamborghini is yeah, Italian. Yeah, those things fall apart. Do they really? Guarantee you. Just look at them. There's no way that's sturdy. That's the ugliest fucking car <laughs> I ever saw. In my Actually, car. Lamborghinis now owned by Audi, so who knows? They might be like much better engineered now. I'm talking shit, obviously. I don't know that much about things other than uh, I know a lot about Porsches. But there's a lot of cars I don't understand about. But God, those things are disgusting. The Avanti, what a piece of shit. Disgusting. <laughs> he was trying to sell it to me for two grand. <laughs> We're 30. Look at that thing. It's crazy. Lamborghinis are like the biggest, like, here's my dick car you can get, right? That's the car that the side they had the doors open up sideways. You walk out of that naked. <laughs> <laughs> like, if I had that car, I'd just walk out with my dick out. Like, what, bitches? Yeah. Ripping up $20 bills as you go. I'd get a mink jock strap. Oh, your boy sent this. Datsusara sent this fanny packs. Oh, really? I got my fanny packs filled to the brim with reed. He's got <laughs> giant fanny packs. Bro, those are great fanny packs. And they fit me. The They're really good great. for the. Yeah. If you travel on the road, you can get a lot of stuff in them. Yeah. No, no, and that's true. Your glasses, your license, mm -hmm. your passport. Oh, oh, yeah. Well, you don't have one of those. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> my plane tickets. My poor, poor Canadians, they have to come down to America to see you. And they have a great time. Yeah. Don't get no, them they wrong. Do. It's a road trip. That's well, why you I do, do Buffalo. Yeah, I do yeah. Buffalo, Toledo. I mm -hmm. try to really give yeah. them a benefit. Seattle. Detroit. You've done Detroit. Detroit. I do Grand Ann Arbor. Rapids. Grand Rapids. Grand yeah. Rapids. I'm trying to Grass. get to Ann Arbor next year. Ann Arbor, we did that once. Did I do that one? I did that once with, uh, I think, Ari. I think at Ann Arbor back in the day. That's a t college town, right? It's a comedy club down there. Yeah, you did it with some. Yeah, yeah. I remember so, you, oh, you came, I did it with Segura. You came back and told me to call. You like go call them. Yeah, they're, they're fun good people. Fun fucking club. Fun. Yeah, there's some good spots where people can come down. The Canadians can come down. Like, well, you can't do Seattle either. <laughs> <laughs> what are you gonna do, dog? You know what I'm uh, I can't do Idaho either. You would Idaho. fucking tear Seattle apart. It's so sad. You can't get into Washington State. They're still breaking my balls, too. Can you Every work that out? Know. I thought you already had that almost worked out like two out. years ago. You know what, man? They want a bunch of cash, and they still want me to go up there and surrender myself. So oh, fuck all that. I'm not surrendering myself. I ain't fucking... Surrendering yourself? Yeah. What does that even mean? Come on in and turn yourself in, and we'll put you through the process. 12 hours in the holding tank. I got shit to do. <laughs> I ain't going to King County fucking jail for that shit. 12 hours in a holding tank? Yeah, you Why know would, what? You, it's not like you're some threat to society. Why do they have to put you in a holding tank? What kind of weird formality is that? Like, sorry, we have to cuff you. Well, wait, wait a minute. You know I'm not. And like, I have no failure to appear. Like, I've, I've always gone to court. I never, I don't have a failure. I even went to court with an alias. Like, I used an alias one time when I got arrested. That's the class I got. <laughs> I covered the spread. When they arrested me, I gave them, like, Joe Rogan's name. And not so you wouldn't get a warrant, I went down there and did the 16 hours community service in the AIDS unit, painting for the AIDS people. So next time you look at me and tell me I got no fucking character, <laughs> think of that. And 10 years later, I go to eat dinner with that guy. And he's like, did I ever tell you I got pulled over and I had a warrant in Colorado? I got, I got arrested in Colorado for shoplifting? No way. I just kept eating my fucking meal. <laughs> Poor guy. But at least he didn't get arrested. I did his fucking time proof. I did my fucking thing. That is so ridiculous. Can you imagine getting arrested in Boulder? I think about the words you told me about Boulder once you go. I was driving into Boulder with my wife, and I kept thinking, this must have been a candy store for Joey Diaz. <laughs> <laughs> How do you get arrested and they let you out without a license? They're all like barefoot yoga people. Listen to me. I was in jail for three weeks as Jose Diaz, waiting bail for kidnapping. I sat in there from December, from November 18th to December like 9th to 10th. I had the jail wired. You do know that. You do know that I could just go up to the garden and say, I need to make a long distance call and he'd let me out. Everybody else had to sign a list. You do know that. You do know I was smoking weed in there and I had all access to Kool-Aid because I don't like milk. <laughs> you don't like milk? I hate fucking milk. <laughs> I like milkshakes, not milk. I had all access. Do you know I got arrested three months? Not even Joe Rogan. I got arrested a month after I made bail and they put me back in that jail and I went back as Jimmy. And everybody was calling me Jimmy. No, 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 no. My name on the fingerprint was the alias and they're fingerprinting me calling me Joey. How you doing, Joey? How's it been lately? I see you're back in here. Meanwhile, on that card, it blatantly says, Jimmy. So they didn't read the card? No. 
They just assumed it was you, but you went in with someone else's. Yeah. And then what happened? And then I called the girl. They said, we can't let you out without a license. So you Driver's know, license? Yeah. I didn't even have the license for that name. <laughs> in those days, there was no paperwork on me at all. <clears throat> if, you, if you arrested me, guess. <laughs> you, you always like Jeopardy, right? Here's your chance to be Jeopardy. <laughs> you, you get no prizes. I never carried a license on me in those days. Till to this day, I hate that bulge in my pocket. I fucking hate it. Hate so what'd it. you do? So I wouldn't bring an ID with me. So I could be anybody when you arrested me. Right. I could be a fucking penguin for all you fucking. <laughs> so, so you just had nothing on. Nothing. You. So they made me call. So I called my girlfriend at the time, and I go, "Hey, how you doing? This is James." She's like, who? I go, this is James. I took you out to dinner a couple of weeks ago. I lost my license. She's like, what the fuck are you talking about? And I'm just the cops right there. And I'm like, I lost my fucking license, and these cops won't let me out unless somebody comes down here and, and lets me out. Now, she knew the kid I was talking about. You follow me? She mm -hmm. always heard me talking about him. So right. I said, James, 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 James. And she goes, okay, James, this last name. And I go, yeah. And she went down there. They brought her in they said what's his name james where's he live she told him and they go okay we'll let you out <laughs> and that was it they gave me paperwork and four days later i turned myself in i went i stood in court i got charged i pled guilty because i didn't want to fuck with it i didn't want to take a shoplifting thing to trial they had me right and i fucking did the uh, community service at the aids unit under this guy's name. Under this guy's name. I did all 16 <laughs> hours of the fucking community corrections. But I met a cop that was there. See, everything works itself on through the other. Because when I was there, there was a cop that would do a detail there. In those days, the, the police, AIDS, that AIDS unit was getting uh, death threats from like militant people and boldly the people up in the hill. And they had a cop there. And I would talk to the cop every day. Talk to the cop a little bit. Hey, how you doing, officer? And we talk about this or that, and one day I got into a beef. I had two felonies, and my ex fucking boyfriend thought he was tough with me. And I said, you know what? I gotta smack this guy, but if I get him, I gotta get him good. And I went to meet him, and I fucking smacked him. Guess who was the first cop on the job? The dude from the AIDS unit. <sighs> this guy's holding on to his face. He came, he asked me, Joey, what happened? I told him the truth, they gave me a ticket. <laughs> So life is a circle, my friend. What kind of ticket do you get for slapping someone? He got a ticket, too. He got a ticket. I got a, a misdemeanor, assault, and he got using a, a racial slur outside the city limits of Boulder. Oh, is that really the case? That's really so the case. So Boulder's always been like that. Yeah, because the football players in 85, those football players that were really powerful, that, that those teams that won the national championship, there was always beef with them in Boulder. The cops always had beef with them. So there was one, but there was a couple incidents. There was Canavis McGee. He just smacked the motherfucker's eyeball out of his head. <laughs> At Todos. You think I'm kidding you? I'm not cracking no jokes. He broke his eye socket. Six foot five, 245. With a smack. With a smack. Jesus. A Stockton slap eyeball went out of his fucking head. Well, he made, might have had a ring on. And then another lady called J.J. Flanagan a nigger, and he punched her in the face. <gasps> So they dropped the charges because she said a racial slur. That's hilarious. So that a this, woman can call a guy and Nick and just get punched in the face. Oh, he slapped her, so they called it the J.J. Flanagan rule. So when God, I got that is so crazy. When I got arrested for that racial thing, I told him he called me a spick, which he did in front of my daughter. So I smacked him. So wait a minute, did the football player smack her or punch her? I think he smacked her, J.J. Oh. Flanagan. That's on the street corner in the Bold and Pearl Street Mall or something. That's how strong that word is. Just smack. And it's, the only, it's the only word that has a letter. Like, you could kind of say the F word, but most people say fuck. And he was still, this is still 88. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> this is 88. This is 90. These are the times when they were coming down on CU football, you know, but they had a lot of shit going on. Like, there's a document, there's a 30 for 30. Oh, really? It's okay. a great for 30 Let for 30. Let me ask you.